This episode is brought to you by the all-new Grand Wagoneer, featuring premium American design, up to eight-passenger seating, and impressive capability. The Grand Wagoneer's innovative in-car technology offers incredible ways to connect you with your journey, like 75 inches of pixel-perfect screens and a 23-speaker Macintosh MX1375 reference entertainment system, so you can fully personalize your drive and create unforgettable memories. The Grand Wagoneer. Grand adventures return. Learn more at Wagoneer.com. Today on the Matt Wall Show, Kyle Rittenhouse takes a stand in his own defense. The DA pulls out every dirty trick in the book in an effort to railroad, and we'll discuss the latest in the case today. Also, a George Floyd biography is coming soon. Will it include the part where he forced his way into a woman's home and robbed her at gunpoint? I guess we'll find out. And two couples at an IVF clinic have a mix-up that results in their babies getting swapped. Plus, YouTube gets rid of the dislike counter in order to protect the fragile feelings of content creators like myself, which I really appreciate. And workplace masturbator Jeffrey Tubin appears on CNN with some highly ironic analysis of the Rittenhouse case. We'll talk about all that and much more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, if you're using the internet without without ExpressVPN, you're leaving yourself exposed. It really is like, you know, running into the gas station with the keys still in the ignition and, and the door unlocked. Uh, most of the time, you're probably fine, but what if you come back to see someone driving with your car? You never know what will happen. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, cafes, hotels, airports, any hacker on the same network can gain access to your personal data passwords, financial information, etc. It doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack somebody. Just some cheap hardware is needed. A smart 12-year-old could do it. I mean, I couldn't do it, but I'm dumber than a smart 12-year-old. Uh, your data is valuable. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling personal info on the dark web. Uh, so why use ExpressVPN? Because it creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. Hackers can't steal your sensitive data. It, uh, it would take a hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption, which means that you're you're pretty safe, okay? You're pretty safe, and you can, if you get ExpressVPN, you are keeping yourself secure. That's the name of the game here. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash Walsh. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Walsh. You can get an extra three months for free as well. Expressvpn.com slash Walsh. In one of the most famous scenes from A Man for All Seasons, and perhaps the best, Thomas More is arguing with his son-in-law, William Roper, about the meaning and value of the law. And Roper wants more to arrest a guy that, that he, Roper, has judged as bad, though he can't explain what law the guy has actually broken. More calmly explains that being bad, generally speaking, isn't against the law in and of itself. You can't go arresting people for that reason because that would be, that, that would be against the law to do. Roper, indignant, accuses more of giving the, the devil the benefit of law. And Moore says that he would indeed give even the devil the benefit of law. Roper, looking to take the moral high ground, says that, well, he would cut down every law in England to get to, you know, get a chance to go after the devil, if that's what it takes. To which Moore responds and says, when the last law was down, the devil turned round on you. Where would you hide? The law's all being flat. This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast. And if you cut them down, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. Now, I've thought about that scene a lot as I watched the Kyle Rittenhouse case. It's clear now and has always been clear to any honest observer that Rittenhouse committed no crime. He's an innocent man. Innocent boy, really, as he was only 17 at the time of this incident. Uh, but the left, to include the corporate media, big tech, Democrat Party, the DA in the case, they're willing to destroy the law, rip it to shreds, cut down every law in the United States if they have to, to punish Kyle Rittenhouse. Now, at least Roper in A Man for All Seasons wanted to cut down the law to get to the devil, which would have been a bad enough idea, as Thomas More explained. Kyle Rittenhouse, though, is not the devil. He is, in fact, a good man, even a hero, as we'll talk about today. The men he killed in self-defense were far more devilish than he is. If anything, then, the left is cutting down the law to defend the devil. But the effect will be the same in the end, if they succeed. We'll be a nation with no law, a nation with nothing that can call itself a justice system. Now, there's plenty more to say about the trial, but let's begin by playing a few important clips from yesterday. Rittenhouse um, took the stand in his own defense. No doubt a risky move to have him testify, considering that the state had totally failed to prove its case or even provide enough evidence to justify bringing the case in the first place. The defense, as we know, basic, uh, basic law here, the de defense is not there to prove anything. It's up to the prosecution to provide proof 
of the crime. If the prosecution can't, and it certainly couldn't in this case, then that should be the end of it. There's really no need for the defense to call a single witness, much less put the accused himself on the stand. That's the way it should work, but that depends on the jury understanding what its role is supposed to be and acting on that understanding without any ulterior motives. Unfortunately, you can't always rely on that, which is probably why the defense tried to seal the deal by putting Kyle up there. Um, Having watched his entire testimony, though I can't get inside the minds of the jurors, it seems to me that the gamble paid off because Kyle didn't come across like a cold-blooded murderer as he has been cast. He seemed very much as he is, a kid. A kid who suffered a terrible trauma and had to fight for his life in the moment on the streets of Kenosha and is now having to fight for his life once again. It's the kind of pressure that would take an unimaginable psychological toll on anybody, especially somebody so young. And that toll, that burden, was made apparent early in Kyle's testimony when he broke down on the stand. Let's watch that. Once I take that step back, I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side. Um, And I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski. And there were There were three people right there. Take a deep breath, Kyle. <laughs> That's what I. <laughs> now, that's what a panic attack looks like for anyone who is not familiar. Of course, as expected, leftists on social media, if you're expecting them to have any humanity, then you were uh, sorely mistaken. They mocked him for this display, accusing him of crying crocodile tears. There are many posts like this one from Anna Navarro. She said, Kyle Rittenhouse shot and killed Anthony Huber, 26, Joseph Rosenbaum, 36, and injured Gage Groskraus, now 27. Think about how much their loved ones have cried real anguish and grief, not crocodile tears. Now, it's funny to hear people like this deride a kid for crying on the stand as he faces false murder charges. Kyle Rittenhouse was violently attacked by a mob, had to defend himself with lethal force, and immediately upon doing that, he was, uh, in order to save his life, immediately upon doing that, all of the most powerful forces in society conspired and have been conspiring conspiring to ruin him and take away his freedom. In the face of this, he cried. Meanwhile, people like Anna, if a, if a stand-up comedian tells a joke or if a politician they don't like is elected or if you misgender them, they'll break down in tears. So they cry all the time about everything, wielding their fragile emotions like a battering ram. Yet they think they're in a position to, to look with contempt on a kid who cries while facing the kind of pressure that the vast majority of humans on planet Earth have never faced and will never face. We talked to you yesterday about how the word trauma is, is way overused and everyone's running around all the time claiming how they're traumatized by everything. Well, here is an appropriate use. This is an application for trauma. This is a kid who has suffered real trauma. That night, that is a traumatic experience. And what he's gone through over the last year and this trial, also traumatic experience. One other point about this. Navarro attempts to solicit sympathy for Rosenbaum and and Huber, the two men who were killed. The media has been playing this game for a year, trying to tug on our heartstrings, calling on us us to mourn poor Rosenbaum and Huber. So it becomes relevant then to point, because they have introduced this, right? Just just like in a trial, and and, and now we're in the court of public opinion, they have opened this door here by, by talking about how we should feel so bad for Rosenbaum and Huber. And on that note, it becomes relevant to point out that Rosenbaum was not only a sex offender, but in fact, a serial child rapist. He molested and annually raped multiple boys. He had just recently got out of prison for sex crimes when this happened. Okay, so he he is a serial child rapist, goes to prison, gets out of prison, and uh, and then one of the first things he does is he tries to chase someone down and kill them. 
To put it as generous as I can, Joseph Rosenbaum was a piece of human filth. I mean, that's how I feel about child rapists. I don't know about you. Huber was slightly better, but only by comparison. Uh, Rather than a child rapist, he was merely a repeat, repeat domestic abuser guilty of, among other things, choking and strangling a woman. Now, these facts may not be relevant to the shootings themselves, but they are relevant if we're being asked to feel sympathy for the quote unquote victims or feel any emotion towards them other than contempt. Rittenhouse was justified in his actions that night because Huber and Rosenbaum were violently attacking him, leaving him no choice, as has been incontrovertibly proven. But it's also worth noting that the world is a better place without people, especially like Joseph Rosenbaum, in it. Bad person. And it strikes me that the left mourns a pedophile child rapist only a few days after celebrating when a different child molester's name was put on a Navy ship. Um, Harvey Milk. Maybe eventually Joseph Rosenbaum will get his own ship too. So these people really seem to be big fans of child rapists. You might start drawing some conclusions about them. Now back to the trial. Perhaps all we really need to say in analyzing the state's cross-examination is that they actually spent time questioning Kyle about the video games that he plays, which put him in the position of having to explain to the DA that video games and real life are not the same. Isn't one of the things people do in these video games try and kill everyone else with your guns? Yeah, it's a video game. It's just a video game. It's not real life. Sir, isn't it true that you've played Super Mario World? Is it not true that in that game you jump on little mushroom men and kill them? Sir. Establishing a pattern. So this is what grasping at straws looks like. And uh, that was, if anything, that was like the highlight. That was the best moment from the DA. Uh, the, maybe the whole trial. That's like as good as it got. It was an absurd and misleading line of questioning, but at least it wasn't a grave constitutional violation. The constitutional violations happened at a different point when the DA began questioning Kyle about the fact that Kyle exercised his right to remain silent after his arrest. Prosecutors are not allowed to stand in front of a jury and imply that silence is incriminating because the whole point of your right to remain silent is that you are not being forced to incriminate yourself. Okay, so the judge then had to jump in and remind the DA of this fact. You need to account for this. Your Honor, I don't want to, I don't want to jury here. He's commenting on my client's right to remain silent. No, Your Honor. I am making the point that after hearing everything in the case, now he's tailoring his story to what has already been introduced. The problem is, this is a grave constitutional violation for you to talk about the defendant's silence. And that is, and 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 you're right. You're right on the you're right on the borderline, and you may you may be over, but uh, it better stop. Understood. This is. I can't think of the case, the initial case on it, but it's uh, this is not permitted. Now it's not often that you hear a judge accuse a DA of a grave constitutional violation in open court. That's how things have gone in this trial. A little bit later on, as the prosecutor continued with uh, lines of questioning that were not admissible and which had been he'd been warned to avoid by the judge, um, continued along this path, the judge was then forced to intervene again, and this time he wasn't quite as kind about it. Why would you think that that made it okay for you, without any advance notice, to bring this matter before the jury? You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. Now, I think what he was going to say there, not to try to read his mind, but... um you know, maybe words to the effect of, like, if there's a conviction here, this is this is an appeal all day long. I mean, if there is somehow a conviction here, a, a, a grave miscarriage of justice, 
The good news, at least, the whole lot of bad news, the good news, at least, is that this is appealed all day long. I mean, you've got, you have the judge in the case telling the prosecutor that he committed a grave constitutional violation. He said, he said you, you crossed the line and did that. Look, there, there are gray areas in life. There are times when the line between good and bad, you know, the good guy and the bad guy uh, might not be as clear. This is not one of those times. Okay, the bad guys may as well be wearing name tags that say, hi, I'm the bad guy. That's how brazen all of this is. And that leads me to two final points. One is, you know, what, what, are they, what are they really doing here? Why are they going after this kid? Well, much of the prosecutor's questioning revolved around the gun he was using and how big it was and how scary it was. You know, he, he, he observes, the prosecutor does, uh, that Kyle Rittenhouse had, had, a, had a bigger gun than, than what uh, his assailant had. So you, you, had a, you had a bigger gun. I mean, he had a smaller gun. So why were you with the bigger gun worried about a smaller gun? Well, I don't know. Maybe because a smaller gun, when you fire it, would still kill me. It became clear as this was going on that the Second Amendment is what he is trying to prosecute. Our Second Amendment right, our right to defend ourselves is on trial. Much of his line of questioning was about really about that. Uh, where Kyle Rittenhouse became, he wasn't even testifying about himself. He became a, he, they were, he was being treated like a constitutional scholar, a, a firearms expert. Kyle Rittenhouse is a symbol. This is not about him personally. Certainly isn't about the, the events of that night or the facts of the case. He's a stand-in, and he represents not only the constitutional rights that the left detests, but also the kind of people that the left detests. Just like Derek Chauvin before him, Rittenhouse is a blood sacrifice meant to atone for the sins of all white men. His personal guilt or innocence is not relevant. Just as a goat sacrificed on a burning altar is not selected due to its personal foibles, it is burned as a symbol, and that's the role that Kyle is playing here. Second, all that should matter in the case is that Kyle is not guilty of committing murder. You know, that should be the end of it. That's all that, ma- that's all that matters legally. E- even if he was reckless or stupid or he shouldn't have been there, quote unquote. Uh, even if he is a terrible person. Even if he's the devil. None of that matters or should matter legally. And yet, I still think it's important to point out that Kyle Rittenhouse is, is a, not a bad person. And I don't think he's even stupid or reckless. And he's not, he's more than merely innocent. He's more than that. I think he's a hero in my estimation. Yes, he put, he put himself in harm's way by showing up to the riot. But where I come from, putting yourself in harm's way in order to defend innocent people and protect property is heroic. That's what heroes do. That's like the definition of a hero. And yes, to protect property too. It tells you a lot about, you know, a lot of people on the left that they, and we get this from the prosecutor a lot too. Well, you would use violent force to protect property? It's just property. Well, again, he used the violent force to protect human life, his own life. That's why he had the gun was to protect himself. But, um, but you know what? You know something? Yeah, I mean, using force to protect property that is also morally justified. It's not only morally justified, it's heroic. What, does the mob have some kind of right? Well, the mob, all they want to do is burn down buildings. They have no right to do that. This, this is people's property. This is their livelihood, their lives, their businesses that are being destroyed. Yes, you could. I would use lethal force to protect, if someone was trying to burn down my home, I would shoot them. I would, even if there was nobody else inside. Why? Because it's my home. It's my property. And you have no right to do what you're doing right now. And I can use force to stop you, and I would. But even when faced with a mortal threat from a violent mob, still Rittenhouse waited until the very last moment to fire. He tried to preserve the lives of the people who wanted him dead until they left him no recourse. I would call that courage, not stupidity. Though, to cowards, perhaps, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. Now let's get to our five headlines. (laughs) 
You know, I don't mean to scare you, but these days there are surveillance apps out there known as stalkerware, and they can collect information from you while avoiding de detection by pretending to be something else. Stalkerware sits silently in the background collecting data, doing things like recording calls and keystrokes, stealing your photos, sending the info it gathers to whoever is spying on you. Every day we put our information at risk on the internet in ways like this. In an instant, a cyber criminal could steal what's yours, sometimes even harm your finances, your credit, your reputation. They can really ruin your life in a lot of ways, and that's why it's so good that there is LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats, uh, things that you wouldn't know about or even think about, like if your social security number is for sale on the dark web. Um, if they detect that your information has been compromised, they will send you an alert, and they will help you to, uh, to fix the problem and make it very easy for you you don't want to use the internet without LifeLock. Nobody can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can help protect what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by going to LifeLock.com slash Walsh. That's LifeLock.com slash Walsh for 25% off. All right. Um, so this is kind of uh, exciting. I, I just got the news yesterday from my dentist that I got to go. I have to get uh, some root canals next week. So I got two root canals I'm uh, in line for. I, I, it's, it, it feels very adult. You know, I've heard so much about the root canals. You always compare, uh, it's worse than a root canal. Never had, I've never even had a cavity before. So, um, and here's the thing. When I, when I do something, I go all in. I'm fully committed. So if I'm going to have a cavity, might as well get a root canal type cavity. And um, so that was my first reaction. Is that this, this, feels like a, this feels like a new step into adulthood in, so, in some way. And I, I guess I, I would be the guy... I'm such a committed contrarian that I would be the guy to enjoy a root canal. That would be my ultimate contrarian take. Actually, root canals are good. But then the problem is I was talking to the dentist and he told me that, um, I don't know why he said this. He shouldn't have said it. But he said, you know, uh, yeah, you, could, you could just do nothing if you want. That is an option. Just don't do anything. You could do that. I said, really? That's you're, you're you're putting that on the table? I could I got this situation. I could just do nothing at all and and live my life. Don't don't tell me that. Like, don't as a doctor. That's the worst thing you could say to me. When I when I blew up my Achilles, the doctor said the same thing. He's like, technically, you know, yeah. I mean, we have the surgery. It's a big surgery. Technically, you could do nothing. We have to tell you that's an option. And I seriously considered it. And I and I'll tell you why. Because there's this combination for me. I I uh, I hate doctors. I mean, I hate going to doctors. I mean, not, not anything against doctors personally. I don't like going to the doctor. Uh, I'm also very lazy. And then, and then, I, and then I have this, 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 this gross overestimation of my own pain tolerance. And so all of those things combine to, if you give me an excuse, I'll just, yeah, I'll just live with it until my teeth fall out. If you, give, if you put that on the table. So now, I'm, uh, now that's just something I have to balance, I suppose. All right. Uh, but my wife does have a, she, she has a pretty firm opinion on it, which is, I don't want your teeth to fall out. Okay, uh, we'll start with this from the Daily Wire. This uh, says a biography of George Floyd will be published on uh, March 17th. So look forward to that. Put, the, put that on your calendar um, to go out and, and run out and pick the, the George Floyd biography up. And it appears to whitewash his life story to highlight his constant search of a better life and his relentless struggle to survive as a black man in America. In a press relief release, uh, Viking Press, a publishing company owned by Penguin Random House, Announced the biography, which is written by Robert Samuels and Toulouse Olurunapa, two prize-winning Washington Post reporters. The book is designed to reveal how systemic racism shaped George Floyd's life and legacy, from his family's roots in the tobacco fields of North Carolina to ongoing inequality in housing, education, health care, criminal justice, and policing, telling the singular story of how one man's tragic experience brought about a global movement of change. And so now this is when we're going to get uh, the whole hagiography of, of George Floyd. I mean, this is, this is an important point. I mean, this is an important step when you're, when you're building this myth. Because so far, with the mythology of George Floyd, St. George Floyd, uh, they have the martyr story, which is mostly false. But the whole rest of his life, they've kind of ignored. And so now, finally, these Washington Post reporters who, as Washington Post reporters are, we know that they are very experienced fiction writers, and so now they're going to, to write this uh, work of fiction, and they've they've got their work they, they've got their work cut out for them, in in some ways. How are you going to take this man, who was a terrible person, terrible, and contributed nothing of value to society whatsoever, and rather than in fact rather than contributing things of value to his community, 
He preyed upon the most helpless and vulnerable people in his community. How are you going to take that and somehow morph it into uh, a, a hero's journey? So I almost would want to read the book just out of curiosity to see how they do it. I mean, I'm not going to do that because I value my time too much and I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the money on it. But um, yeah, a struggle to survive as a black man in America. This is about a, so is that searching for a better life? Is that the chat? When we get to the searching for a better life, you know, part two, searching for a better life. Is that the part where he forces his way into a woman's home and robs her at gunpoint in front of her kid? He was just searching for a better life. Don't mind me, ma'am. I'm just searching for a better life. Now hand me over all your money. But, you know, it is, it's true in a, in a, in a way um, that in some of, in, in these communities and cities, um, as a black man, or really if you live in these communities at all, no matter your race, there is a struggle to survive. That's true. These can be dangerous places. But it's a struggle to survive because of guys like George Floyd. They're the ones who create that struggle. I mean, they're the ones you're worried about. Despite what, no matter what anybody says. No matter what they claim about how they're, you know, uh, we, 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 uh, we, fear the, we fear the police. No, I mean, if you are a woman living in, uh, living in the inner city, you're not worried about the police. You're worried about George Floyd breaking into your house. All right. Um, so I'm not usually one to talk about news from the fashion world, but there was a point I wanted to make about this. I thought it was so- somewhat interesting. This is from MSN. It says, Tom Ford says cancel culture inhibits design. The 60-year-old fashion muse behind the iconic label um, says the, uh, the fact everything is now considered appropriation is limiting fashion. Speaking to The Guardian, Ford said, cancel culture inhibits design because rather than feeling free, the tendency is to start uh, locked into a set of rules. Everything is now considered appropriation. We used to be able to celebrate other cultures. And now we can't do that. He says the future of fashion is increasingly cartoonish. Instagram has broken down the rules. People dress up to take pictures of themselves to post online. Everything is exaggerated, especially the eyebrows. Uh, so it's, he it says this is the future, future of fashion. It's very cartoonish. He's, and I mean, just not as a fashion expert myself, but just by observation, he would seem to be right about that. Uh, but also... It's, it's, it's impossible now because of these rules of appropriation. And this is the nature of style. You know, it is, it's, it's something that's, it's always a fusion. There's always different influences that you're bringing together, right? And now we're drawing these lines and saying, well, no, if you're, if you're a white person, you're not, you're not allowed to wear anything that has any kind of influence from the outside world. Which means that basically you got to walk around naked, which is great news if you're, you know, Jeffrey Tubin. But for most of us, it's not so good. Because no matter what you're wearing, no matter what you're eating, no matter what music you're listening to, it is always going to be the result of at least some kind of fusion, some kind of outside influence. Because these things are, are human in- inventions, human constructions. Um. Whether we're talking about, you know, the culinary world or fashion or music. I mean, these are art. And people are influenced by, by the world around them. You know, I, I was reading an article recently, and I almost did it for a daily cancellation, but then I figured it's just, there's, there's really no point. What else can I say about this other than how stupid it is? But um, w- one of these media outlets, they were very concerned about um, appropriation that parents are committing in, in how they wear their babies. You know, baby wearing is a, is a thing where if you, you know, you could wear one of those backpacks or you, it's, there's, there's different things that, that parents can do. Makes it a lot easier because it frees up your hands. Uh, you can strap the baby, you know, onto your chest or onto your back and, uh, and go about your day. And you might think that, the only thing to worry about there when you're wearing the baby is just to make sure it's safe and you got everything strapped together so that the baby doesn't fall. But apparently, no, this is a very, this is a very fraught area because there's a lot of cultural appropriation. And so this article was, was concerned with letting parents know if you're a white parent, 
Make sure that you're not appropriating, you're not accidentally being racist in how you choose to wear babies. That's how absurd it's gotten. But there's also another point, too, that, um, you know, he's talking about the style world. I don't know much about that. But what you find in general is that cancel culture makes everything boring. It would, I guess it does that with style. It also just does that with, with opinions, with discussion. That's one of the, I think, underrated aspects and consequences of cancel culture. Uh, yes, it's very tyrannical. It's very limiting. People are afraid. But also, it, it, in the midst of all of that, as people are trembling in fear and not wanting to say anything that will upset anybody, everything just becomes so boring. All discussions become so so ag- aggressively, relentlessly boring. And why is that? Because people are afraid to experiment with ideas. Uh, to use the cliche, they're afraid to, to kind of think outside the box. Because that's, in the past, that's actually how, that's, that's part of the process of figuring out how you feel about things and what your ideas are. Sometimes in, in order to do that, it, it involves you first expressing an idea that maybe you're not 100% sure about. And you say, hey, I was just thinking this, here's my opinion on this, I'm not exactly sure, but here's a thought that I had. And then you have a discussion, and through that discussion, you start to kind of hone it a little bit and mold it and shape it. But you can't do that anymore. You can't go out there with an outside-of-the-box thought where you're kind of experimenting with ideas. Everybody is looking for cover in a crowd. That's one of the reasons why people stay in their echo chambers. It's especially why people who have a platform and speak in front of cameras, why they try to stay in their echo chamber, because there's, there's protection there. You can hide behind other people. Um. And you find this on the right, too. It's not just on the left. There's a lot of this that goes on on the right. In fact, you can notice this. I'm I'm very sensitive to it. I don't know how much you, because I'm I'm in this world, but I'm not sure how how obvious it is to people outside of uh, this business. But I notice, you know, like conservative commentators, something happens. There's a new event, um, say like the Kyle Rittenhouse case or something. And you've got a lot of conservatives who will, they kind of wait they don't want to say anything at first. They have an opinion. They have a perspective. They don't say anything. They they kind of they wait for someone to be the first one to say something, express an opinion, and then a few others say it, and then they jump in and, and say, okay, well, I can have that opinion now. Because at least if they come after me, I've got some company. And it just makes everything very boring. Uh, all discussions, everything, you know, there's, there's uh, no matter what side you're on, you have your approved opinions that you know you can say and it's safe because everybody says that. Um, and that's where everybody, that's the, the zone everybody lives in and it becomes very boring. All right, this is from the New York Post. It says, two couples spent months raising baby girls who weren't theirs after a mix-up at a Los Angeles fertility clinic, which implanted the mothers with each other's em- embryos during in vitro fertilization, according to a lawsuit. Daphna Cardinali said that she and her husband, Alexander, quickly suspected that the girl she gave birth to in late 2019 wasn't theirs because she had a darker complexion than they do. Alexander said during a news conference, I had a weird sort of a gut reaction when she was born. It wasn't anything logical. It was just like an instinct. In the delivery room, he had expected a fair child like their firstborn, but he was surprised to see the baby girl come out with much darker skin. It was so jarring that Alexander... Uh, actually took several steps away from the birthing table, backing up against the wall. Um, but I guess this isn't funny, but I'm trying hard not to laugh at this situation. But the parents ignored their doubts because they fell in love with the infant and trusted their doctors. I was overwhelmed by feelings of fear, betrayal, anger, and heartbreak, the distraught woman said, adding that she suffered trauma when she found out months later that she had carried another woman's baby and that the other woman had her child. And now this is working its way through the court system. You know, there, of course, the fertility clinic is going to be sued out of existence. And, and you know, rightfully so. This is, a, this is a pretty... When it comes to customer service mistakes, um, implanting the wrong baby in a woman's uterus, pr- pr- pretty high up there. You know, it's a, it's a little bit worse than delivering a pizza late or something. But it does maybe raise some questions about... IVF as a concept. When, when you have a, a procedure where this can even happen, 
This is something through modern technology. We've cre- This is a risk that never could have happened before in human history. There was no, there was no chance. Now, for 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 thousands of years of human history, right? Uh, there was a chance. This this is something that that fathers might have had to worry about that the baby that's uh, in the womb is not theirs. But you never had you never had a mother who had to worry that the baby wasn't hers. Now, because of uh, of IVF, this is obviously doesn't happen very often. We would we would hope. But it's kind of it's a it's a possibility that we have created. And it's a possibility we've created because that's what happens when you move the very human act of conception out of its natural confines and you do it in a petri dish. Um, maybe that's kind of a red flag about this sort of procedure. And because what we're actually doing, and the reason why I don't like IVF, why I'm not a fan of it, is because, not just I'm not a fan of it, I object to it on moral grounds, because it's the commodification of human life. You're quite literally treating human life like a commodity, in the most literal sense. And you have, you know, you, you, you have a bunch of embryos. And, and then, and then w- w- what happens, maybe this mix-up kind of thing, this Freaky Friday mix-up thing doesn't happen very often. But what does happen all the time is that you've got a bunch of, uh, uh, of embryos and then, you ha- and then you have leftover embryos that get stored in a freezer like, uh, you know, like ground beef that you're not going to have time to cook up. And uh, it just stays there for a while. And then eventually, if they're never used, okay, and think about the language here, the embryos are never used, um, then they'll be destroyed. So this is the reduction of human life down to a commodity being treated very much like an object where we talk about, you know, you could have a surplus of it. What do you do with the surplus? You just destroy them. Um, it's, it's hard. And I admit this. If you come at, if you, if you approach life from a materialist perspective, and all you see, when you look at human beings, all you see is material. You think, that, you think that's all we are. In fact, all we are, all you are, is, is an object. If that's how you see it, then, yeah, from, from that starting point, it's going to be hard for me to convince you that something like IVF might be morally problematic. But if you see life as more than that, if you're not a materialist, then I think there's a reason to be skeptical of anything that reduces life down to mere material. All right, next, this is from TechCrunch. I think this is good news. I'm very uh, very happy about this. It says, YouTube today announced its decision to make the dislike count on videos private across its platform. The decision is likely to be controversial given the extent that it impacts the public's visibility into a video's reception. So if you're watching this on YouTube right now, if this is correct, then you should not be able to see how many people disapprove of my show. The bit that, What I just talked about with IVF, there's going to be a lot of people that don't agree, either even on my side. And now, guess what? You're not going to know how many disagree with it. And I, and I personally am a fan of that. It says, but YouTube believes the change will, be, will, will better protect its creators from harassment and reduce the threat of what it calls dislike attacks, essentially when a group teams up to drive up the numbers of dislikes a video receives. The company says that while dislike counts won't be visible to the public, uh, it's not removing the dislike button, so you can still dislike but nobody will see that you disliked it. And then we as YouTube creators will have to go back into our YouTube studio uh, dashboard and we can look up that information if we want to. But, but I won't look it up because I, I, I don't want to know. It's better not to know. So your dislike, it will be sent off into the void. It, the dislike itself will be stored basically in a, in a cyber freezer and I will never go. It'll just stay there. I'll never look at it. You'll, I will never know. And, uh, you know, there are some people saying that this is kind of absurd, but, but uh, you know, and, and you might hear a phrase like dislike attack or when a thumbs down is equated to harassment, you might think that sounds pretty absurd and silly, but, you know, it's easy for you to say if you're not a YouTube creator. As someone who is on this platform every single day, you just have no idea what kind of emotional and psychological toll it takes on a person to see all those thumbs down. I, I cry every day 
when I check my videos, if I see even one, I shed a tear for every thumbs down I get. It is deeply traumatic. And so I want to thank YouTube for finally standing up for us and for our feelings. Uh, now let's dive into the comment section. Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. As you know, people always tell me that uh, one of the things I really love, love, of this, love about this show is the passion that I bring to uh, the subject that I talk about, uh, especially when we're talking about mortgage refinancing. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. American Financing, America's home for home loans. Uh, new sponsor on the show we're very excited about. The home you're living in right now can cost you less. It's true. You can lower your payment and save thousands a long term. You just have to refinance to one of these incredibly low mortgage rates and do it now before they're gone. Uh, they're expected to rise in the new year. You cannot afford to miss out on this deal. It takes just a 10-minute call to American Financing, America's home for home loans. For me, the call takes longer because I spend a lot of time gabbing about the subject. But if you want to be in and out, you can. You'll work with a salary-based mortgage consultant, someone who will guide you through custom loan options that can save you up to $1,000 a month. That's right, $1,000 a month. And you don't have to reset your loan to get those kinds of savings. You can choose any term. 10 years and over because you shouldn't pay interest for years that you don't need. Pre-qualify for free at 866-569-4711. That's 866-569-4711 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. All right. Jennifer says, Matt, you're smart enough to know the Derek Chauvin case was the end of our justice system. Now let's see if you're brave enough to admit it. Uh, well, I, I think the Derek Chauvin case was a blow to our justice system. Um, and I, as you know, believe that Derek Chauvin should have been acquitted. But, you know, I, I think you're, you're, you're really underestimating and understating what's happening with the Kyle Rittenhouse case by looking at this as a one-to-one -one comparison. I mean, what's happening with Kyle Rittenhouse, and he hasn't been convicted yet, and we're praying that he's not, but if he is convicted, it would be even, even more egregious. I mean, for example, in the Derek Chauvin case, you didn't have any scenes like what we just played where the judge says that there's a grave constitutional violation happening right now in this case. So in terms of how egregious and blatant and out in the open it is, I don't think we've ever seen anything quite like the Kyle Rittenhouse case. So I think this would be kind of the nail in the coffin, in my opinion. Um Carla says, talking about the video yesterday we played of the boy in the dress with the ab abusive mother, it's clear that the boy in the opening video has been coached by his mother. She dressed him up and paraded him before the camera in order to satisfy her own sick ego. What I want to know is, where is that boy's father? Either he's absent in the boy's life or he's a weak and pitif pitiful excuse for a man. Yeah, well, you always know that anytime you see any of these, it, 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 it's not a coincidence that in the vast majority of cases, when you see these uh, these poor little kids being paraded around on camera, on TikTok, Instagram, on you know in in the media, these poor little boys dressed up like girls with makeup and everything, um, it's not a coincidence that it's almost always the mom alone doing this. She's all, she's the one on camera. She's the one holding the camera. And what that tells us is that is that one hundred percent. This is a one hundred percent certainty. The father is absent from that home, 100% certainty. Now, he, he may still be a physical presence. I think very often he's absent in every sense of the word. But there may be cases where he is a physical presence, but he is still absent. There's, there's no real, there's, there might be a man, a guy in that house physically sitting around like a lump on a log, but there's no father in that home. There's no real father because a real father would put an end to that immediately. Um, you know, I don't, I, I am not one to recommend divorce. Um, but you, you know, you're a father and your wife tries to dress your boy up like a girl. That's, that's one of those drawing lines, ultimatums. You're not going to do this to my son. This is not going to happen. Um, all right. Spazio says, I think you need to show some proof of the claims you made about Alfred Kinsey. It's the second time you claim he's not a valid scientist and his research is pure nonsense. There's no legit documentation on the internet that back up your thoughts. And this is a really unsettled argument because of that. Well, Spazio, yes, there is. You know, I, I, I'm not going to hold your hand through this. Increasingly, I'm, I'm just annoyed with people. You say, what's your source? Give me a, just sp spend five minutes looking it up yourself. Why don't you? 
I can't hold your hand. Yeah, everything I said about Alfred Kinsey, 100% factual. Okay? But you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to spend a little bit of time. I can't, see, what you want is you want me to give you a link with the bullet points and so that you can spend five seconds and you can read three sentences and say, oh, well, there it is. No, this is one of those things. You got to spend a little bit more time to understand the, the full history of, you know, of, of Alfred Kinsey and the sexual revolution and how, you know, it's, it takes a little bit. To, in fact, you, you might even have to read uh, uh, some books about it. You might, you might have to read an entire book if you really want to understand it. But what I can tell you is that what I said again is, is a fact. Um, you know, his methodology when he released, uh, uh, you know, sexual behavior in the human male. And the methodology that he used, the, 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 the populations, the segments of the population that he was studying and gathering all of his survey data from, this is, it's not disputed. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Zuko says, it's very hard to maintain control at the video of the poor, abused four-year-old. It's amazing, though, that she gave us the nice comparison of his age, though. He's clearly confused. Because he's four and his mom insists on changing definitions on him. Right, that's exactly the point. Eric says, I bet 99% of the people who've seen Eternals had no idea it was directed by a woman. Yeah, that's the other point about the, the claim from the film critic yesterday. This, this Marvel movie, Eternals, that apparently nobody likes and nobody wants to see. And the critic says, well, it's because it's directed by a woman. People are sexist. And as I said yesterday, that the exact opposite is the case. But critics especially bend over backwards to find any reason they can to give a good review to a movie that's directed by a woman. But as far as the audience goes, this just shows the kind of the bubble that these film critics live in. They don't understand how the average film uh, moviegoer actually experiences movies. The, the average moviegoer has no idea who the director is of any of these movies. I, I bet if you went up to just the average moviegoer, the average person who watches movies, which is most people, and you ask them to name like five directors, they probably couldn't even name five. They might be able to give you three. Like, they could tell you Steven Spielberg, but maybe they could give you Christopher Nolan. I mean, this just because most people don't, it does, doesn't matter to them that much. Um, and uh, they certainly aren't, aren't looking up information about the director and then saying, well, this one was directed by a woman. Well, I'm not going to watch this. That's not what people are doing outside of the, the bubble that you're living in. When it comes to Biden's vaccine mandates, the Daily Wire isn't backing down. You heard us talking about this yesterday. If you watched the backstage show, we uh, filed our lawsuit against the tyrannical and unconstitutional mandates a week ago today, and we're already seeing results. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a temporary stay over the weekend, preventing the Biden's, man Biden Biden's mandate from going into effect, citing grave statutory and constitutional issues. There seems to be a lot of those going around today. This uh, does not mean the battle is over. Rather, the battle has just begun. Biden is determined to pass these mandates no matter what. And that's why we have to keep fighting. We're not, we're not just fighting for the Daily Wire employees. We're fighting for the medical freedom of every single brave American. And it's extremely important that everyone uh, ha makes their voice heard right now. This is an urgent matter, and your medical freedom depends on it. If you want to support the fight to make your personal medical decisions without government interference, sign our petition against Biden's authoritarian mandate. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have already signed the petition in just a few days, but we need many more people to stand up just to reach our goal. So please head to dailywire.com slash do not comply to sign the petition today. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we cancel once again CNN, uh, this time for a segment on the Kyle Rittenhouse case featuring one Mr. Jeffrey Tubin. As you recall, though you surely wish you did not recall, Tubin, CNN legal analyst, gained international notoriety last year when he was caught uh, badgering the witness during a Zoom meeting with his coworkers. Tubin, Tubin pulled his tube out, you, know, you might say. He tried to, to put it gently, uh, get a hold of himself during this meeting. He's always been a self-congratulatory type, so he decided to give himself a hand, so to speak. And while he was engaged in this DIY project, his colleagues looked on in unimaginable shock and horror. Now, for most humans on Earth, Handling your situation in a work setting in full view of other employees would lead not only to immediate termination, but it would likely foreclose all future possibilities of employment. You could maybe get a job as assistant manager at your local sex shop. I don't know. Though on second thought, you certainly could not be trusted in that setting either. So really, that would be it for you. You may never find gainful employment ever again. But Jeffrey Tubin works in corporate media, and the, roles are, the rules are different there. 
Which means that, in this case, he was back on the beat with uh, CNN within just a few months. CNN has mostly not seen it necessary to justify its decision to employ and provide a public platform to a man who masturbated during a work meeting. To the extent that they've bothered to explain it, the rationale seems to be that Tubin's behavior was an accident. Now, he's the real victim here, you see. He didn't know that his camera was on during the Zoom call. He thought he was uh, debugging the hard drive in the privacy of his own home. And it may indeed be true that he didn't know the camera was on. But the act itself was not an accident. Granted, I was not on the call, which is why I still have eyes and I haven't gouged them out. But I still feel safe assuming that Tubin didn't slip and fall and accidentally masturbate. No, he quite intentionally decided to perform that act during a work meeting while watching his coworkers. The only thing he didn't intend was for them to know that he was doing it. I fail to see how that makes this any better. I mean, if there's a guy on public transportation sitting in the back of the bus masturbating, hoping no one sees it and someone does, can he say to the cop, well, I didn't mean for anyone to know that I was doing it. Especially because we can assume here, as always is the case in these kinds of situations, that when a pervert is caught in the act for the first time, he was only caught for the first time. It's not, however, his first time at the rodeo. And yet he's back on the air, which leads us finally to this segment. And uh, let's all watch cautiously. Jeffrey, Two thoughts. Yeah. Two thoughts. One, what kind of idiot 17-year-old hmm. gets a giant gun and goes to a riot? He has no license. He has no training. He thinks he's going to scrub graffiti off with his AR-15. I mean, the stupidity of this is like, what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot went wrong. The good news for Kyle Rittenhouse is that he's not on trial for being an idiot. He's on trial for homicide. Right. And in that respect, right. I mostly agree with Joey that this is a tough case for the prosecution because it does seem like it, he has a plausible case mm -hmm. uh, of self-defense. And, you know, if, if it were illegal to be an idiot, the jails would be even freer, f even more crowded than they are now. Mm -hmm. Homicide's a different matter. Very bold move by CNN to use a glass table. Um, also, you have to feel bad for the guy sitting right next to Tubin, as Tubin's kind of waving his hands around like that. I mean, his life must have been flashing before his eyes, which is still better than Tubin flashing before his eyes, I suppose. As for Tubin, he accuses Rittenhouse of being an idiot. Now, just to emphasize here, the man who pleasured himself during a Zoom meeting and forgot to turn the camera off is calling somebody else an idiot. He says it's fortunate for Rittenhouse that, you know, being an idiot isn't illegal. Well, it's fortunate for Tubin that masturbating in front of unwilling spectators isn't illegal. Oh, wait, it is illegal. Just not if you're a member of the favored class. Now, putting his childish analysis of the Rittenhouse case aside, I mean, you can really see why CNN just had to bring the masturbator back on the air because otherwise they'd be deprived of insightful legal opinions like, that guy's an idiot, LOL. But putting that aside, Jeffrey Tubin really shows us the nature of cancel culture, doesn't he? Jeffrey Tubin shows us Quite a lot, actually, way more than we want to see. But the lesson he provides about cancel culture is useful. Cancel culture is, as I always said, arbitrary by definition. Why is Louis C.K. still banished to the cultural hinterlands, persona non grata, and yet Tubin is on cable news? They did the same thing, but Tubin is arguably worse because he didn't get consent ahead of time. And there have certainly been people who committed far less severe infractions or no infraction and yet suffer punishments far worse than whatever Tubin suffered, which was really nothing at all. When it comes to workplace sexual harassment specifically, we live in a world now where giving your female coworker a compliment may be sexual harassment. But, I mean, in, in Tubin's case, ma masturbating in front of her during a work meeting is not sexual harassment. But this is all by design. It's a power move by CNN, really. Cancel culture is arbitrary. It's also left-wing, inherently. It was largely invented by the left-wing corporate media. It's their thing. Cancel culture belongs to CNN and its fellow corporate media organizations. It will decide who is canceled and who is not. Jeffrey Tubin is on their team. They happen to like him for whatever reason, and so they will grant him a pass that nobody else, I mean nobody else on the planet anywhere, would be granted. There's no coherent moral philosophy underpinning this. Cancel culture isn't, isn't it's, it's, not le it's not mere left-wing puritanism. It's not even a moral panic. It's a weapon, and they will decide how to wield it. 
That's why Tubin still has a job. And it's probably still invited on Zoom calls. And everybody else on the call just has to make sure that they don't eat lunch beforehand, I guess. That's also why I must say again today that CNN is, of course, canceled. I will leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review. Also, tell your friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, we're there. Also, be sure to check out the other Daily Wire podcasts, including The Ben Shapiro Show, Michael Knowles Show, The Andrew Clavin Show. Thanks for listening. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Ali Hinkle. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Kyle Rittenhouse clears his name. A major publisher commissions a hagiography of George Floyd. And Biden's vaccine mandate might cost nearly 40% of truckers their jobs amid a supply chain crisis right around Christmas. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.